What is more powerful than a man? Let's find out. Hey, how's it going everyone? It's me, Liam, aka Mr. Knight, aka Dystopia Junkie, and here I am with another GCSE Poetry Analysis video. Now, this video is going to be for possibly my favourite poem in the anthology, Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley, which can be found on page 19 of your WJEC Educast Poetry Anthology, that green book you all know and love. As per usual, I recommend that you have your anthology out in front of you as you watch this video and that you have a pen for making notes, at least three different highlighters and some extra paper as well, just in case you need some more room for making those notes. So if you've watched any of my other videos in this series, you should know the structure by now. And if somehow you've not watched any of them yet, then a link to the playlist that they all appear in should be appearing on screen about now. So how about you click it and go through all of the poems in the anthology. So the structure of this video will be that I will read the poem, go through its context, provide a close reading, consider the poem's meaning, mood and the poet's motivation. I'll also think about themes and then finally at the end of the video, because I'm lovely like that, there will be an optional revision task for you to complete too. So if this video helps you with your GCSE revision, then please do consider dropping it a like and subscribing to my channel, Dystopia Junkie. That way, all upcoming revision content will end up in your subscription feed. And if you turn on that notification bell as well, you will even receive a notification whenever I drop a new video too. Okay, so generic, cringy YouTuber self-promotion aside, here is the poem. Make sure that you are following along, either on screen or by using your anthology. Ozymandias. I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well, those passions red which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias. King of kings, look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. So that's the poem in full. Just for the sake of repeating myself, it is important that we consider the context of this poem, because applying context to your analysis is equal to a third of your marks. So Shelley lived between 1792 and 1822. Knowing the exact dates isn't massively important here, but knowing that he grew up in a vastly different time will help you to understand this poem a bit better. Shelley was well educated. He went to Eton where he was bullied, which led him to retreat into his imagination. And he also went to the University of Oxford. However, he was expelled from Oxford within a year for promoting atheist views. Shelley had a troubled relationship with his parents, especially for being expelled, and his relationship with his father was particularly difficult. Now, his father was a member of parliament, and without wanting to psychoanalyze Shelley too much, this difficult relationship with his father may have been something that resulted in him having a negative view of authority figures. 
Shelley's parents rejected his beliefs, which included vegetarianism, political radicalism and sexual freedom. Again, this may have been something to do with how he viewed figures of authority. His political views are said to be partly inspired by the French Revolution, where ordinary people overthrew the monarchy. Shelley had a complicated love life and had children with two women. The second woman, Mary Shelley, wrote Frankenstein. Shelley was friends with many other writers of the time, including Lord Byron, and Shelley is considered to be one of the most influential romantic poets of all time. And as I said before, I will go over what romanticism means in my video for The Prelude, so have a look at that if you want to clear a picture of what romanticism means. As well as thinking about the poet, it is also worth contextualising the poem's content. Just who or what was Ozymandias? So Ozymandias was what the ancient Greeks called him, but he was also known as Ramses II of Egypt. He was an Egyptian pharaoh. Now pharaohs served many roles in ancient Egypt. They were the embodiment of the god Horus on earth, they were the head of government, and they were the leader of the army. He ruled Egypt for a very long time, from his teens into his 90s, which is remarkable given that he lived over 3,000 years ago. He is often regarded as one of the greatest pharaohs ever. As such, he had a number of statues and structures built in his honour, and interestingly, part of a statue of him, which is the picture that you can see on your screen, was obtained by the British Museum in the 1800s. When Percy Bysshe Shelley found out that the British Museum was going to obtain this, he was inspired to write the poem. By the way, this statue is still in the British Museum, so if you're in London for one reason or another, why don't you see if you can pop into the British Museum and see it for yourself? Right then, so now that we have read the poem and considered its context, we can begin to analyse it. Now is your chance to grab those highlighters and to set up your own key, using one colour for imagery, one for language and another for structure. It is always useful to have something to say about a poem's title, since you will be given all of the titles in your exam. And so there are the two questions that I would like us to consider when thinking about this poem's title. Pause the video, have a read and think, and maybe make some notes too, and share them down in the comment section below. So a nice and easy one to start with, Naming a poem after a person suggests that they are somehow powerful or important. And using context, we know this to be true because Ozymandias was an excellent Egyptian pharaoh. Ozymandias' name suggests that it is natural for him to rule, much like air or breathing are natural. So here we have the poem's first four lines. So for these four lines, I think it's worth thinking about one, two, three, four things. So have a look at my questions, have a think, and then see what notes you can make. As ever, my ideas will follow in just a moment. Okay, so this first one is a bit complicated, so allow me to explain. The story of Ozymandias is told by a random traveller. The poem is told by a persona who is not that traveller. So there's a few levels of narration going on here, and it gets even more complicated later when Ozymandias speaks. Because Ozymandias is buried in a story told by a random traveller, which is contained within a persona's poem, a great narrative distance is placed between the reader 
and Ozymandias, suggesting that he is not all that powerful and that his fame and reputation had faded. Another way of looking at it, and maybe this is simpler, is this. If the poem's persona had to be told about Ozymandias by some random traveller, then Ozymandias wasn't widely known at all, meaning that his fame and power had faded. Take whichever version you understand best and maybe make a note of it. Although antiques may be worth a lot of money, they are also old, outdated and fragile. By describing the land, Ozymandias' land we can assume, as antique, the poem suggests that it is no longer relevant, showing how Ozymandias no longer has power. Vast and trunkless legs of stone is a lovely image. It suggests that Ozymandias was once powerful and sturdy, as the stone statue was seemingly huge, but by saying that the legs are trunkless, meaning they don't have a torso, it also shows how weak and broken he is now. This image of a shattered visage, visage meaning face, suggests that no person not even Ozymandias, has long-lasting power. Time and nature will eventually overpower man. Next up, I thought we would look at the next four lines, as well as the last line that we'd literally just looked at. So in total here we have lines four to eight. And despite there being more lines, there's actually only one, two, three questions this time. As ever, have a read, have a think, make some notes. Remember that you are welcome to share your ideas down in the comment section. Just make it clear which line or lines you're referring to by using quotations. Consonants is the repetition of consonant sounds. It's basically a more specific type of alliteration and calling it alliteration isn't necessarily wrong. Anyway, in this example, the consonants in cold command amplifies Ozymandias' harshness, as the k sound is quite harsh. As it says on screen, the contrast between survive and lifeless reminds the reader that Ozymandias is dead, just like his legacy almost is. This acts as a quite disheartening, I guess, reminder that no matter what we do in life, we cannot last forever because time will catch up with us. Words or phrases like frown, sneer and mocked present Ozymandias in a negative light. Shelley may have wanted to show that power corrupts people which may have been inspired by his own political beliefs. He felt inspired by the French Revolution, after all, where civilians overthrew the monarchy. He was also maybe uh, influenced by his family life because he had a poor relationship with his father, who was an MP. And here is the last part of the poem. There's quite a lot going on here, so there are one, two, three, four, five, six questions for it. You know the drill by now. I'm sorry to say that this is where part one of my analysis of Ozymandias comes to an end. So if you want the answers to those questions, you're gonna have to wait just a little bit longer and watch part two of my analysis of Ozymandias, which will be coming out very, very soon. In the meantime, why not try to answer those questions that are on screen just a moment ago on your own and maybe even throw some of your analysis and annotations down in the comment section too. As ever, thank you so much for watching this video and I really do hope that you have a fantastic rest of the day. Cheers.